workshop is Measuring Corruption, Strategies for Strategies on Meet Women's Voices. And um, I'm sure we all know about um, Peter Drucker, the management guru, who's credited with the saying that what cannot be measured cannot be managed or improved, depending on you know, what version you're reading. And this has generally been found to be true in performance management in relation to human resources or generally organizational management and achievement of organizational goals. And so the question is, in relation to corruption, how does this apply? And if we apply the same analogy, it essentially means that what corruption we do not measure, we cannot manage and we cannot make improvements. And so, because our concern is to ensure, to prevent corruption where we can, to fight it and where possible, and punish those who are found guilty, it is important then that we measure. So we then go on to the question of measurement. Have we measured corruption? If we have, how effective are forms of measurement to ensure that the efforts we put in are sufficiently inclusive and broad-based and effective? Have we paid sufficient attention to the gender dimensions of corruption? How can we ensure that the voices of everyone, all the voices, are heard and that there is real progress? So to answer these questions and throw insight on a host of issues relating to these questions and much more, we have a panel here to discuss the topic. And I'll introduce our panelists. First, my immediate left is Laura. Laura Nguyenkindi is from Uganda. And Laura serves currently as the Africa Regional Vice President of the International Federation of Women Lawyers, FIDE. Um, Laura has, in terms of the FIDE hierarchy, been there, done that. She used to be country um, regional, country president of FIDE Uganda, and was on the board of FIDE Uganda. And she's done a whole lot more. She's obviously a lawyer, because she's a member of the International Federation of Women Lawyers. So welcome, Laura. Beside Laura is Jennifer. Jennifer. Savri Bradford joined the UNODC Corruption and Economic Crime Branch in 2013 and has beheaded the branch's work on gender and corruption ever since. And the work has culminated in a growing array of initiatives, one of which is a most important recent publication titled The Time Is Now, addressing the gender dimensions of corruption. And she's showing us the, the book, the publication, and she'll also let us know how we can access both physical and e-copies in due course. So through her work as part of the Secretariat to the implementation review mechanism of the UNO, United Nations Convention Against Corruption, she has coordinated over 40 country reviews. And she represented the branch in the UNODC team during the negotiations of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. In 1998, she started her UN career at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Turkey and Cyprus, and subsequently in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. So Jennifer has been around. <laughs> Having worked at both the UN headquarters in New York and the United Nations mission in the Congo DRC, she joined UNODC in 2005, and from 2010 to 2013, she established the UNODC National Program for Ethiopia. I did say she's been to several countries. So she holds a master's degree in law from Lund University, Sweden, and also has a master's program of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. So let's welcome Jennifer as well. Then, beside Jennifer is Lillian. Lillian. Is an, Lillian Ekanyangu. I heard somebody um, give an interesting version of her surname yesterday, Lillian Ekiao. But she's Lillian Ekanyangu, and she's an attorney at law. She currently works as an anti-corruption consultant 
at the UNODC in Nigeria. She's done significant anti-corruption related work and she's done research and programming and she used to be the head of the technical unit on government anti-corruption reforms in Nigeria, uh, uh, an office called TUGA, which was um, working and putting together, coordinating reform efforts, anti-corruption reform efforts across several agencies. And part of her work led to um, the process of corruption risk assessments and they developed a methodology which has since been applied in various agencies in Nigeria. So she's also done a lot of research and training on global and regional anti-corruption conventions and of course on gender and corruption. So welcome Lillian. And then Ivana, Ivana Korailik. I did a great job, right? <laughs> Ivana is an executive director at Transparency International in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Can we please welcome Ivana? Okay, so thank you very much. So we'll get into the heart of the conversation. Like I said, conversation is around how do we unmute? What are the strategies we can deploy to unmute women's voices? How do we measure corruption? What are the strategies to deploy? And I'll start with Laura. And so Laura, you speak to us about the Ugandan experience, or Ugandan example. What does the Ugandan landscape look like in terms of gender and corruption? Thank you, Azinov. Um, just like other African countries, or most other African countries, we do have frameworks in place uh, for prosecuting and response uh, mechanisms for tracking uh, corruption in the broadest terms. But there is, I must say, no systematic uh, tracking or collection of gender or of gender-based uh, corrupt acts. And I would like to to reflect back on two incidents that stand out in my mind. I'll quickly tell the stories as it, uh, as it struck me um, as very key to the issues we're talking about today. Flashback to 2005. I was a very young lawyer, very impressionable, and something of something that was really scandalous, uh, a, a corrupt act that really broke national headlines happened in 2005. We had the Global Fund on Malaria, HIV, and Tuberculosis, and it's in many African countries, funded by donors. And we woke up to headlines that two, two, about 200 million, 201 million dollars had been embezzled by public officers. And uh, as a result, the donors said they were cutting off funds, uh, another 200 million uh, that had been earmarked for HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And I thought that there was going to be a very uh, in-depth conversation on how especially women were going to be impacted, first of all, by the embezzlement, and two, by the withholding of funds, uh, because uh, in, uh, these are key health issues that are critical, especially to the most vulnerable of women uh, by virtue of low income, low employment rates, illiteracy. The most vulnerable poor women and illiterate women are the ones who benefit in the area of uh, health services. And um, so the, 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 the loss of these funds was going to, I, I thought that conversation was going to happen. There was a lot of discourse, there was a lot of debate at the national level and prosecutions were initiated, but it was all focusing on the three ministers, the three male ministers who had embezzled the funds, the top officials, and complete silence on the impact of corruption on these affected populations, on the interim measures and, and uh, that could be put in place to ensure that these women actually continue accessing the funds or accessing the services that were intended for them, especially given the very high HIV rates that Uganda had suffered from. But there was uh, total silence from so many quarters and uh, I started understanding that when it comes to grand corruption, the experiences and lived realities of women uh, seem to, 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 you know, to be completely omitted. And the one incident that seemed to excite people around gender dynamics was when this woman, uh, one of the officials who was, um, who was um, identified as having embezzled funds was a woman. And then all of a sudden it became a very polarizing debate of can women steal 
half the debate was saying, no, she cannot have stolen, she's being framed by the cartels of power, and the other half of society was saying, of course she has access to power, of course she embezzled, she's part of the cartel. So this was the only sense in which the gender dimensions of corruption were, were, were impacted on. Even at that time, although I was a young lawyer, a young feminist, a young activist, I didn't have the tools, I didn't have the, the language to understand issues of intersectionality and gender dimensions of corruption. It became very clear that this is, this, this, this is missing uh, in, in, in our society, this kind of um, tracking mechanisms, but also responses and um, focus on the, the differentiated experiences of men and women. So very quickly, uh, moved to 2012. Uh, from 2012, civil society came together in Uganda. The civil society actors who were tired of seeing grand corruption and uh, people getting away with it. Um, so we started a big uh, movement called the Black Monday Movement. And it had civil society actors from all walks of life uh, highlighting gaps in government protection. Uh, or funds in, uh, in institutionalized embezzlement and the women's movement. And um, uh, my organization that you introduced was playing a critical leadership role in terms of galvanizing different constituencies to talk about these issues. We would uh, we would walk on the streets like evangelists and give out letters, you know, flyers and newsletters to different members of the public, uh, trying to explain how much funds have been embezzled, how citizens are affected, how citizens can then, you know, act. Uh, especially um, in terms of protesting, but of course using the law to to to, to cast a strong uh, light on this on on, on this uh, the prevalence of corruption, and within that movement, um, so the the other um, CSOs came to us and said, "You're in the women's movement, and you're taking the lead on this issue. Um, can you tell us which women are which women are being um, are, are suffering the most as a result of corruption?" Which area, in which areas are women most exposed to corruption? How are their vulnerabilities exacerbated? And that is when we began to understand that there is actually very little, if, I would say no data at the time. There was no data. We could not get access to this data. We could not give informed responses. We could not really have empirical evidence. And a few CSOs after that took up some research, but of course constrained um, by lack of funds. We had one CSO that subsequently um, did research on, on women's experiences in cross-border trade and the petty corruption that they're exposed to. But um, the, the other things that government did, maybe we'll, we'll talk about it later, later on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> and so Laura throws off the issue of the lack of consistent tracking of corruption and also throws up the issue of other conversations around uh, gender and corruption. Are women more corrupt, corruptible than men? What is the propensity of women to engage, participate in corruption, and all of that? So I will invite um, Ivana to speak to us, because Ivana has, in the TI office in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they've done very interesting research and some of these questions she will speak to as um, she speaks to us. And so Ivan, I'd ask you, given the recent uh, publications on gender and corruption and sextortion, what kind of, which your office um, 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 undertook, what kind of data did you use and what does that data show? Hi, thanks. Um, well, uh, TI Bosnia has been uh, doing different kinds of surveys for more than 20 years related to uh, different perceptions of corruption, the presence of corruption, forms of corruption. Uh, but we have also been providing legal assistance to citizens since 2003. Uh, and um, finally, uh, an opportunity came up uh, to try to combine all of this data uh, to uh, measure and review uh, the connection and correlations between gender and corruption. Uh, first of all, because there's always a need to uh, modify the approach towards different categories of citizens uh, in order to be able to assist them in more meaningful ways. 
Um, and I have to thank to our founder, Mr. Boris Diviak, who has actually developed uh, the methodology for this research, which actually uh, combines uh, both the uh, uh, data on perception of corruption through public opinion survey, but also uh, qualitative data of the cases that uh, TI in Bosnia and Herzegovina has been working on, the cases that women and men uh, respectively reported to our chapter, uh, which provided a lot of, of, of uh, uh, valuable information on different approaches and different concerns uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to gender, uh, how actually, uh, and being able to, to see how actually women approach the issues compared, uh, compared to men. Uh, we have also uh, um, reviewed and collected data specifically on uh, judicial st statistics, for example, when we talk about complaints uh, of corruption, different reports, and who, uh, who actually is reporting, and who are those that are uh, reported. Um, but we, of course, have to uh, 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 take into account the, um, the environment uh, when we talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina, and similar as, as in Uganda case, uh, basically the chapter in Bosnia was uh, founded, uh, one of the reasons was that because there was also a need to assess different uh, uh, misappropriations and abuses related to international funds after the war and uh, uh, pointed out actually and focused on, on a reconstruction of the country uh, after the war in the 90s. But then the forms of corruption of course changed uh, and it affected all of the sectors within the society. And uh, unfortunately, uh, more than 20 years after that, uh, we are now in a situation where uh, the level of corruption is getting worse. Uh, even when we talk about the uh, CPI results, when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have been declining for more than 20, 12 years. Uh, and um, e also when we talk about uh, uh, when we talk about the data related to gender equality, uh, I have to say that uh, we have not made sufficient progress in the past years. When we talk about the opportunities for employment, uh, when we talk about the uh, political participation of women and, and the number of women who actually hold important offices and, and hold important positions, which of course is relevant when we talk about the access to power, but also the opportunities for corruption and also the types of corruption that women face uh, compared, compared to men. Um, as I said, uh, we have done a, 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 a wide survey across uh, the country on a representative sample. It tried to compare uh, perceptions between women and men uh, in that respect. And um, some of the research previously ha have already been uh, uh, dealing with issues whether, what is the perception, whether the women are more corrupt than men, uh, whether uh, countries would have a, a, a lower level of corruption if, uh, if more women uh, were in power. And I have to say that, uh, uh, yes, I mean, uh, when we look at the data, more citizens generally think that uh, men are more corrupt uh, uh, than women. but. We still have the majority of citizens thinking that uh, they are equally corrupt. Uh, and the same is also uh, when we talk about uh, whether the, the, the level of corruption would be uh, lower if uh, women uh, were, if more women, women were leaders in the country. Uh, we have, of course, uh, more citizens, uh, more women than men actually thinking this, but uh, generally, um, uh, when we look at the majority of population, uh, they think that uh, it doesn't actually uh, make an important difference. But this is also, as I said, uh, it has to be connected to uh, how many uh, women actually uh, are in opportunity to abuse their power, to, to, to get engaged in any kind of corruptive uh, activities. And this also shows when we look at the statistics, judicial statistics of, of uh, prosecution of, of corruption cases in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we have four times more men being reported for corruption and prosecuted for corruption than women. Uh, but as I said, we also have a, a very small percentage of women being in power and being, uh, being in, in uh, opportunity to abuse their power. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, the review of previous research, uh, there has uh, been for years hypothesis that uh, women report 
uh, uh, pro-social sectors uh, rather than some other sectors. And when we analyze the data from our advocacy and legal advice center and, and the cases that women reported, uh, when we look at significant differences between men and women, we see that um, women are most likely to report cases related to education uh, and related to health uh, because uh, they have more uh, contact with these sectors uh, and because they uh, have more impact and directly uh, influence the women who, who actually uh, report. But this also, uh, even when we talk about uh, um, the perceptions whether they would pay bribe uh, in the health sector and education sector, uh, this differs a lot uh, when we take into account the level of education of women, and which, uh, uh, which is also something that we need to always have in mind, not just to desegregate data related to gender, but also uh, the areas, uh, the environment, and also the, 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 the level of education, which in, in, in the case of Bosnia showed, uh, proved to be a very important factor uh, in terms of the readiness of women to engage uh, to report corruption or uh, uh, to, to engage in any kind of activity to, uh, 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 to, to fight corruption. Uh, but when we look at the other sectors, we can see that men are uh, more likely than women to report corruption in the government, in judiciary, uh, and other sectors. And, uh, and this uh, tells us, I think, a lot on, on uh, what uh, is perceived to be uh, important but also feasible uh, by, by women. And across all sectors, uh, most of the reports, of course, uh, come, uh, that, come that, that are related to employment, uh, both when we talk about health and education, but also uh, other sectors that both women and men uh, report cor corruption. Uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, um, per perception of uh, whether they would pay a bribe, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, there's not much uh, difference uh, when it comes to that. Uh, but the reasons uh, for paying a bribe or not paying a bribe uh, uh, differ between women and men. And uh, what is, I think, very, uh, very interesting is that the main difference is related to practical reasons when we talk about women. Uh, where most of the women, and the biggest difference is that they said that uh, they don't want to pay for what uh, that for the service that they already paid for. Uh, it's not about knowledge, it's not about uh, the fear, sometimes it's, uh, it's, about, uh, the, the practical, it's about the practical reasons. Uh, and of course, as I said, the education uh, plays an, a very important role in, in whether uh, women are likely to get engaged uh, and uh, do uh, something about uh, uh, um, the corruption, uh, the case, whether they are witness uh, or uh, they are a victim. Uh, and this data also, uh, both when we talk about the perception, but also when we talk about specific cases that women reported, show uh, that women are most likely to report if they are direct victims of corruption. Uh, while men, uh, there is a, a, a significant difference in the percentages uh, of, of men and women who are witnesses who actually uh, uh, approach and, and, and report cases of corruption. And this also, I think, and I will conclude with that and later we can come back to, 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 to other uh, um, indicators and uh, what the study showed um, is that uh, there is not just, uh, when we talk about, uh, the, both uh, women and men are aware generally equally about what the corruption is, uh, what kind of problem it presents, uh, but whether to get engaged or not, uh, there is a, a, a significant difference in, in the motivations. Uh, women are more likely to, to report if they are direct victims, uh, if uh, they feel uh, directly impacted, but also uh, if they uh, realize that they can actually do something about it and that something can happen after that. There's so many factors taken into account when we look at different uh, perceptions and the cases that women report. It's about the means, it's about uh, uh, um, also confidence is whether 
uh, I'm aware of actually what I'm doing at, at this moment, and I will, we will uh, go back to, to do other um, data and also some uh, uh, um, cross-referencing between uh, the data when we talk about uh, specific consequences of reporting. All right. Thank you very much, Ivana. <laughs> Thank you. So we've gone from Uganda, where we had little or no data, and gone on to Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we have data and um, how it's been used, talked about its impacts in relation to the pro-social sectors, where women have more of an interest, and how the level of education and general environment makes a difference in terms of reporting. So we'll go on to a study that's been conducted by the UNODC in Nigeria. And so Lillian, I'll ask you, this study uh, conducted by the UNODC, the Large Scale Corruption Survey, um, why was it necessary to conduct a gender, specific gender and corruption analysis? And what were the specific findings um, from this survey? Thank you very much, Ezuma. Um, the UNODC has actually conducted um, two large scale corruption surveys in Nigeria in recent times, one in 2016 and then 2019. The slide you're seeing on the board there is what I have just picked out, um, which shows um, prevalence of bribery by sex, because the study was about um, experiences of citizens with bribery. In both 2016 and 2019, it shows that women paid less bribes when in contact with public officials. In 2016, not much um, hula baloo was raised about the findings, but I recall vividly in 2019 when the findings were presented, at the dialogue to discuss the findings, a lot of women's groups raised a number of issues. For instance, the question that was asked at that gathering was, um, you are saying women pay less bribes. What currency are you discussing when you are talking about discussing the payment of bribes? What is your description of bribe? What is your definition of bribe yeah, when they encounter public officials? Incidentally, the study was released at a time when there was also a BBC um, documentary on sex for grades in one of the Nigerian universities which was very much in the media at that time. So in people's consciousness, it became clear that women pay bribes with currencies other than what we are used to, the normal um, dollar, euro, or whatever. So women's groups were asking the UNODC, if you're saying women pay less bribes, which currency did you measure? What type of bribery are you talking about? So that this particular st slide raised more questions than answers. The issue is, why is there a difference in the experiences of men and women in paying bribes? Is it, does it mean that women interact less with public officials? Or that the women blatantly refuse to pay bribes? Or that public officials are likely to solicit, solicit bribes from women? So given that more questions and answers were raised, the UNODC then went back to the field did further analysis, gathered more data, and then had the specific gender and corruption um, survey. Yes, and then that survey disclosed a lot of things. They disclosed some patterns, about very differential patterns about the experiences of men and women in terms of um, uh, uh, paying bribes and corruption generally. There were gender differences in how they experience corruption, how bribery works in the first instance, what is paid, how it's paid, and even gender differences in other types of corruption, such as vote buying and nepotism. Some of the key findings of, that, of this report um, suggest <coughs> that yes, the report clarifies that 35% of men and 24% of women who come into contact with public officials within the surveyed period pay the bribe. 
And this is consistent with what occurs in other countries, like what um, Ivana was saying in the case of uh, Bosnia now. Women seem to experience corruption differently and sometimes more drastically than men. Women, for example, we are more likely to be confronted with corruption when interacting with, with the health sector. And this is very important because this now gives an indication of the particular demographic that experiences corruption more. The women who go to public hospitals to access health are usually the women who are at the lower rung of the ladder. And here, they experience corruption more intensely than their male counterparts or women in other demographics. Yeah, because this is one service they cannot avoid. If it is driver's license, getting passports, or seeking political office, you find less women as such gatherings or demographics. But health is one service that women of all strata cannot avoid. And the ones who use public hospitals experience more corruption than, than men and than other demographics. Then women in particular, young women and girls, are also subjected to sextortion when they use what is called the body currency corruption to pay for services. So if you're measuring bribes or their, their exposure to bribes and you leave out that section completely, the data is bound to be distorted. Incidentally, when the UNODC went back to the field, 70% of respondents, including both men and women, admitted that this form of bribery exists. It's just that it wasn't being talked about. And um, this was one of the issues that now led to the UNODC having a specific um, survey on the experiences of women in, in relation to corruption. Uh, what is important here, what is interesting is that in the previous surveys, 2016 and 2019, there was data disaggregation. So there was a semblance of the voice of women being heard. But the problem was the kind of questions asked and what the, the disaggregated data was used, the kind of analysis the disaggregated data was subjected to. So that was why the UNODC carried out a specific gender and corruption survey. Uh, but it has also been argued that, that the, uh, most um, surveys do not um, reflect the voices of women, mostly because it is expensive even to disaggregate data. That is why you see everything lumped up together. It is even more expensive to have a separate um, um, survey. Each time you measure, then you have to have a separate survey. So that is not sustainable. The question then is, how do we have one survey that reflects the voices um, of everybody? Are there strategies we can deploy to make sure we capture everything under one heading? Um, perhaps we'll talk a bit about it later. Uh, I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. And so Lillian throws off the issue of the body currency, corruption, um, arising from the survey she spoke about. And when it comes to, she, she talked about the BBC um, Sex for Grades um, documentary. And you know, across universities in Nigeria, both before and after that um, BBC report um, was released, there are loads of instances where lecturers have been dismissed for sexual harassment um, against the female, um, sexual harassment of female students. And interestingly, there was a 2021 study titled Sexual Harassment on Campus in relation to a Nigerian university. And 60.1% 60, 60 of students who participated in the study admitted that there was sexual harassment on campus. But there's also the issue of, so that's it on universities. Recently in Nigeria, a female police officer in a video that went viral on uh, social media was talking about how she was being harassed by her male superior who even threatened to shoot her because she refused his advances. But, you know, so yes, there is the issue of body currency corruption. But we'll go on to Jennifer, who's shown, on the publication, shown us the publication, The Time Is Now. 
and this was uh, the UNODC's first venture into the area of gender dimensions of corruption. And this document has been translated into various languages, Arabic, French, Spanish, and English Braille. The Russian translation is underway. So Jennifer, I'd like to ask you, what impact has this uh, publication had in the global effort to prevent and fight corruption? Thank you, and um, before I start, Happy International Anti-Corruption Day. It is today, 9th of <laughs> December. <you>. Yeah? <laughs> so, um, I think one of the um, main impacts that this publication has had is that it has brought this discussion to various international fora where gender has not been part of the discussion before. It has blazed the trail, I would say, or at least helped to. Um, I'm just going to touch on various elements of it here, and then I'm going to go into uh, a survey that we carried out in Ghana, where we had a specific module on the gender dimensions of corruption recently. It was launched in uh, July this year. Um, our colleague, unfortunately, our male colleague, who was going to be on this otherwise fully women panel, unfortunately could not make it, so I'm stepping in for him. So if you wish, I'm, I'm doing two presentations in one. You have the outline of the publication here, as, uh, as, as we yes. heard. It's been translated. It's available online at UNODC's website, so no problems there. What's interesting is that we, at UNODC, we try to be solution-oriented. Because citing the problem is easy. Stating that there is an issue that we see that corruption impacts women and men differently is fairly obvious to those of us who work in the corruption area. But what do we do about it? That's what we try to find in working with, um, with this document. One of the main findings is that, you know, a lot of people mistake this for, is this women versus men? Who is more or less corruptible? It's not about that. We're all corruptible. I'm sorry, corruption is part of human nature. And women are no less corruptible men than men. But as we know generally across the crime statistics uh, area is that women tend to be more risk averse, but also they tend to have less opportunity to be corrupt. They don't have the decision making spots and access to money and other undue advantages as it's described in the Convention Against Corruption. Um, so what we have here is diversity disrupts the established collusive networks which are prominently male and I'll try to explain what I mean by this. So being less empowered and having less access to power and decision making, women are frequently excluded from the pre-existing networks, which tend to, by consequence, be predominantly male. And to explain this, we speak about herd behavior, group behavior, and I portray it this way. A predominantly single sex group, because it's not necessarily only men, it can also be only women. Women are not just victims, women are also perpetrators. A predominantly single sex group that caters to its own members and their success, mostly at the cost of excluding others. And depending on how deep seated the group's social norms are, by not being represented in the group, women then will not only end up being left outside, but they will also be actively excluded. So in the end, this type of herd behavior creates an environment that facilitates and is conducive to collusion and corruption. And the conclusion in that is that a diverse environment is a more inclusive one, and one that therefore can disrupt pre-existing collusive networks. And we have examples around the world where, for instance, all of a sudden, in Lima, Peru, for instance, the, the entire traffic police was replaced. It was deemed uh, highly corrupt. It was all male. It was replaced in one go by women, only women. And guess what? Corruption disappeared. 
So there was, at the big turn of the millennium, you know, there was this thought, ah, women are the magic trick. You know, this is, we add women and then corruption disappears. It's not that simple. It's more related to the fact that a sudden increase in women in a particularly corrupt environment also, corrupt, also holds corruption. This uh, table is available in the publication. I'm not going to go into it any further in the interest of time. Um, so what do we know in the public and in the private sector? We know that, um, as it says, gender equality and anti-corruption policies can be mutually reinforcing. Again, think of the mixed work environment anywhere, and it will have an impact because, and we don't necessarily always understand why, having a mixed environment and a diverse environment is less corrupt. A gender equal top management, this is relating to the private sector, improves opportunities for women, so gender equality, but it also boosts financial performance. It's very interesting. And uh, here I'd like to, I have a few quotes that I use that I think can really highlight what I'm talking about. Um, there's data from the S&P Composite 1500 Index, and this is from 2015. I have a slight update later, but because we're in America, there are more CEOs of large US companies who are named David at 4.5% than there are CEOs who are women at 4.1%. And the twist is that David isn't even the most common first name among CSOs. That would be John at 5.3%. Now, January 2022, the S&P 500 list, women currently hold 31 or 6.2% of CEO positions. So there's a slight increase. But increase in women CEOs increases profit. So, you know, it seems like such a no-brainer. Why are we hesitating? What are we waiting for? Again, go back to what I was thinking, what I was talking about earlier, <coughs> collusive networks, environments, people cater to them, people of their own liking, of the same people, you know. Women, we stick together. Men, we stick together. I trust her because she's a woman, and so on. There's more needed. So, I think I'll come back to the Ghana report with the next question because that's where we actually have the juice. Um, it's true, global standard is having evidence as the basis for policy making. And those who are invisible in data are also invisible in policies. And this is a quote from Sylvie Duré, who was the director for the Swiss Federal Office on Gender Equality. So at UNODC, we've tried to collect and create an evidence base. We have the time as now. Uh, Lillian just spoke about our survey in Nigeria and the efforts there. And the third publication relates to qualitative study that was done in Myanmar by a colleague, um, bringing together focus group discussions and so on. I think what's really important to show here is that it's not just quantitative data. We'll come back to quantitative data under the Ghana report later, but we need both. We need the numbers, but we also need to understand the context within which they exist so that we can really create the policies that correspond to the national situation. In fact, if you wish, we are all born into societies where we are fed and brought up on different social norms and stereotypes and biases. We all have them. The question is, are we aware of them? So I will stop here and uh, come back for more later with the, the Ghana report, the corruption in Ghana, where we went to town and did a whole module specifically, specifically um, looking at the gender dimensions of corruption and, and the gendered impact, trying to dig a bit deeper to understand why, so that we have the data for our evidence base. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Can we please applaud? Thank you.
And so we've seen an evolution from problem identification to solutions. She talked about representation, diversity, inclusivity, its impact on um, gender dimensions, on, on corruption, essentially. Then she, some um, interesting quotes, if you're invisible in data, you're invisible in policies. We'll go on to um, the second round of um, interventions by the panelists. But before then, I'd like to ask, does someone, have a, does someone here have a burning question, a burning comment, so that perhaps they can, the panelists can integrate that in the next uh, responses they have or in the next set of interventions? Any questions, any comments? Great, so in the interest of time, Laura, I'd like to ask, in your experience and in your view, are government anti-corruption measures gender responsive? And what strategies would you um, recommend for unmuting the voices of women? Uh, thank you, Zimon. So government, and uh, especially, is it on? Should be on. Could you want to? No. Oh, great, it's on. Right. Thank you. So, as I said earlier, government has put in place frameworks, but uh, these frameworks were not gender responsive, I would say. Uh, there have been improvements. Uh, from 2007, the Inspectorate of Government, which is charged with the anti-corruption mandate, and it's also the National Ombudsman, put in place a data tracking mechanism uh, for, for corruption in, uh, with a view to developing appropriate uh, prevention and response uh, mechanisms. Now, the challenge was that they relied on 71 indicators drawn from secondary data. They didn't rely on real-time surveys or opinion polls or, you know, uh, some kind of empirical evidence uh, to, to, to develop these indicators. So they were mostly drawn from the Mo Ibrahim Index that's very pertinent to Africa as a governance framework. They looked at the World Bank indicators, Transparency International Barometer, and out of these extracted 71 indicators to track. And these indicators were largely, by default, gender neutral in terms of sex, uh, sex uh, uh, disaggregated data, but also gender indicate indices you know, that could, could give the kind of um, analysis and information that would uh, cast a stronger light on the gender dimensions of corruption. So it was not very successful in terms of shedding more light on some of these issues for us. And then uh, in 2014, the, the, there was a conscious decision by the Inspectorate of Government to narrow down to 18 indicators that they were monitoring. And these indicators were also being tracked from the point of view of national baseline governance surveys that had been conducted within the same year. And these surveys were conducted based on equal numbers of men and women and focus group discussions. So again, the perspectives of women and men were filtering into these, the responses. So from that point after 2014, we see, we see surveys that are more responsive in terms of uh, just, you know, what are the gender dimensions? How do men and women experience, uh, I mean, uh, corruption, but in a few select areas. And although, that, although the, there was sex disaggregated data and some perceptions that were so, the analysis though falls back on gender neutral analysis. And in 2021 20, December, the Inspectorate of Government carried out a very uh, important um, study on the costs or, and, and extent of corruption in the education sector. And again, we hear the words extortion. It was very interesting to hear government in a government, a government agency in a government report using that term was found to be prevalent, especially in tertiary institutions. Very important point, because now you're beginning to drill down on where could the, the gaps in protection of uh, women or experiences of women be captured. Gender neutral analysis. I tried to even use a word search to see, I put in the word girl, woman, man, female, male, nothing. It's gender, gender neutral analysis. So again, um, really lost opportunities for for, for gender responsive um, tracking. And so, uh, as in, uh, in, uh, in, in closing, I would say that I think that I've had the Inspectorate of Government as recently as last week talk about the need to adopt a whole of society approach. And I guess the questions then remain, what does that mean? 
what does that mean in reality in the fight against corruption and in tracking corruption? What does that mean for men? What does that mean for women? Uh, if we are unequal, if we are different, what does that mean in reality? What in, in highly patriarchal uh, structured communities, what does that mean? Who gets to participate? If we're talking about women uh, casting a stronger light on women's experiences and the impact of corruption, which women are we talking about? Are we talking about that woman who had access to power, who committed an act of corruption? In, are we talking about uh, corruption in the grand corruption settings, in formal offices, white collar jobs, or are we talking about the corruption in the petty, petty corruption in the trade sectors, at the point of service delivery that Lian is talking about at the hospitals? Where is this focus going to be? These are very critical questions for us. And um, the need to, to measure corruption in sectors where women are predominantly affected uh, and impacted is, I think, where we, as civil society, will now um, give str uh, a stronger, stronger attention and uh, emphasis going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. So Ivana, please speak to us about the specific challenges women face in relation to reporting either sexual corruption or other forms of corruption. And also tell us what can be done to ensure protection and a conducive environment for women as they engage to protect their rights. Thank you. Is this working? Mike, please. OK, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, if we can just go back to, to the presentation, I think it, it will be easier to, to, to uh, go through some, some of the most important uh, questions that you, you raised. Yeah. Uh, we already talked about uh, specific motivations for women when it comes to, to reporting corruption and uh, something that maybe uh, I didn't mention earlier uh, was related to... Uh, uh, um, Sorry, Ivana, just Sorry? a minute. If you go back to the first set of slides, Thank you. So go ahead, Ivan. Um, something that 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 maybe uh, wasn't mentioned earlier, uh, related to the motivations and and different uh, uh, challenges uh, when it comes to to um, women engaging and and reporting corruption. Uh, I already mentioned that education and how important it is in terms of whether women will engage. And and our cases within our uh, legal advice center show that when we look at the uh, profiles of citizens who uh, report corruption and when we look at women specifically, they are usually uh, more educated, uh, more emancipated, and, and younger uh, women. Uh, so there we see that we don't have enough representation from, from uh, other uh, groups of women, that, uh, which of course indicates that we should probably rethink all the approaches uh, when it comes to approaching uh, the women and, and trying to, to, to motivate them uh, in that sense. Uh, but also the other thing is opportunity costs. Uh, reporting corruption and engaging in corruption requires means, it requires time. Uh, and also when we look at the difference between women who are educated or emancipated in, in, in different sense, um, uh, and compare it to more traditional women who depend on uh, and are um, put into these roles uh, of submissive um, uh, um, women who have to respond to uh, patriarchal society uh, and have to fulfill their roles. In that sense, women don't have enough time to actually engage in the fight cor against corruption or reporting corruption or spending years pushing for a case to be solved. Uh, and uh, this is also something that we need to, to have in mind uh, so that uh, we have, when we look at the solutions and how to approach, uh, to not just provide uh, education, but also to provide means, uh, to provide support in that sense, uh, and to provide uh, environment where women will not just feel safe, and, and we haven't even begun talking about specific consequences for women who report corruption, that also face different kind of uh, retaliation mechanisms, uh, uh, harassment, even sexual harassment as a consequence of reporting corruption in another sense. 
but not just so, so we shouldn't just talk about providing safe environment, but uh, also uh, providing tools, uh, but the tools that will be adapted to the women's needs. Uh, when it comes to them being time consuming, when it comes to uh, enabling anonymity, uh, when it comes to um, being efficient uh, on, another, uh, on another end. Uh, and I will just finish with this, apart from, from the uh, protection, we, we also should, of course, uh, focus on uh, legal means of protecting generally whistleblowers. Uh, and adapting these mechanisms also specifically to women and specific challenges that they face. Uh, that's why, um, as a result of the study that we did, uh, the first uh, kind of point of focus that we were uh, discussing is working directly with women's organizations who provide different uh, types of assistance to, uh, to, to women, uh, legal assistance, uh, psychological counseling, etc. So they, they can equip them better in terms of how to engage, how to report corruption, how to uh, basically have the, the best possible tools. Uh, and also, uh, at the, the end, uh, I think it is very important, uh, uh, also, both when we talk about generally corruption, but also sexual corruption as a specific form, and we talked about uh, this uh, earlier, uh, is that how we actually present victims of corruption in the public. Um, and that, that's why it's really important to work not just uh, with civil, other civil society organizations, but also with the media who report on these issues because we, we see too many of the examples of secondary victimization uh, uh, that women who basically report either corruption or uh, 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 sexual harassment or any, uh, any other uh, crime, uh, they go, have to go through uh, secondary victimization and being targeted more than men uh, in that sense. And we just not see it with, with uh, regular women, we also see it with high profile women who are activists, who are uh, visible in the public, who are journalists, who are, who are uh, researchers, etc. Et who, uh, when we compare uh, the uh, types of retaliations against these uh, women, uh, they are more uh, likely to be uh, harassed in, in terms of personal uh, discreditation uh, compared, compared to men. Thank you very much, Ivana. And so we go on to you, Lillian. From the survey that you spoke to us about, what would you consider to be the best strategies to capture the voices of the different demographics, including gender? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there are two issues here. First of all, to get in the voices of the different demographics, and then secondly, what to do with those voices, because the two are in, related. If you get their voices and you don't um, use it for programming or use it for something visible that can be seen, uh, it will be more difficult for them to be forthcoming. Um, first of all, to get in the voices, you need to put on a gender lens and find the women where they frequent like we have talked about the health sector. There are other sectors where women can't but go. So if you're polling, if you're scoping, if you're surveying, pay a lot of attention to those places where you're likely to find them. And then the nature of the questions you ask. If it's something quite personal, or they are afraid of victimization, either in terms of um, sanctions or shaming, you need to take cognizance of the cultural context in the way you frame the questions. If you ask a woman, have you ever had to um, submit to sexual favors to get something, you're not likely to get any response, even if she has. But if you put it in the third person, do you know of people who have had this experience, you're likely to get an answer, even if she's talking about herself. That's just one example. Um, also, we have all, from the Nigerian survey and of course from different parts of the world, we have also seen that in certain sectors, women are less likely to demand bribes or to accept bribes. If, what do we do with that information? Uh, Jennifer has given an example of the traffic police in Lima. How many of such models have we implemented 
finding those areas where the women are, are more likely, more accountable, more transparent, and then infusing them into that process and use it as an example that can be replicated in the larger um, anti-corruption agenda. Uh, so it's not just getting the voices out, we also need to um, make use of the, the benefits of getting those voices, the results of the surveys. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. And so, Jennifer, we come back to you. You so, talked about the Ghana survey. Yes. Okay, here we are. So, I would please ask you to re-put the other, uh, the last PowerPoint presentation from the first round. <laughs> so, <laughs> if I can have the clicker. So, the Ghana Corruption Survey, what did we do? We had a long-standing request from Ghana to carry out a corruption survey. Uh, Ghana was part of the, um, of the uh, case studies in The Time Is Now. Uh, Ghana is one of the few countries that has a national anti-corruption action plan that states already uh, several years ago that the differentiated impact of corruption needs to be further addressed and studied. So we went to town. We thought, this is it. Uh, what kind of support from uh, the German Ministry for Development Cooperation, BMZ. We had funding and we supported the uh, data collection element of the Ghana Corruption Survey. Um, what did the survey find? A lot of what we'd already heard, it confirms. No? Low reporting rate, mostly because it's not worthwhile or it's just how things are done. In total, 3% of corruption and bribery is reported in Ghana according to the survey, 15,000 persons, by the way, across the entire country, all districts. Um, why is it important to have data? Because every country is different. And on the left-hand side on the slide, you can see several countries, gender disaggregated data and so on. It doesn't really matter what the countries are. What it shows is that there is a huge difference between countries. And you need to understand what the landscape is if you are going to start drafting policies to address these differences. Uh, in Ghana, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, the share of male public officials who solicited to take bribes um, was twice that of women, except in one sector, in the health sector. There, women, actually female public officials, were more likely to request bribes. Um, like this. The other thing that we did maybe not, is that we started on what has already been mentioned several times here, we started looking at sexual corruption. With such an important gender component, it would have been a missed opportunity not to start asking the questions that Lillian highlighted. If you don't ask them, you're not going to get the data. So we included the questions. And we tweaked them. We tweaked them in the sense that um, we tried to, we had two different questions. One was, do you know anybody you have you ever experienced? Didn't really get a lot of responses there. But when we asked the question, and I will read it out so that you understand a little bit. This is in the past three years. Did it happen to you? So personal, first-hand experience, that a teacher, master, lecturer, professor, health worker, other public official, who may have been your supervisor or colleague, if, you're, if you work in the public sector, made you understand that unless you provide sexual favors, you won't get, for instance, a job, promotion, pass an exam, get medical treatment, or any other public service. And it also included the prevalence estimates where they had answered yes to, have you ever been asked for sexual favors and refused? And what is really important here is this refused part. The refused itself, meant that people were given cover to come forward. In general, in Ghana, people didn't hesitate to talk to friends, family, and even to the surveyors about their bribery experiences, except when it came to sexual corruption. There are 50%, both men and women, said that they found it very difficult to discuss this and just wouldn't. So to have this data at all is very important. Number one, it exists. Number two, it's not just women, it's men also. And this is one area of sexual corruption where I think, you know, we too frequently bypass and think 
in particular, Laura's talking about patriarchal societies and so on, it's a woman's issue. Oh. In French, they even have a, an expression, it's the promotion canapé. You get your promotion via going on the sofa. You know? It's there, but we need the data to, to raise the discussion, to put it in front of the public officials. Last slide, which I think was personally, I think, fascinating. Percentage of men and women who think that providing sexual favors for public services is acceptable. The yellow is always acceptable. The green is usually acceptable. Sometimes or never is blue and red. Which means that 8% of men and women think, eh, just, again, why don't you report corruption? Because that's the way it is. And why would I report it? Nothing will be done anyway. So I think you know this is something that's really interesting. Where do we go from here? Of course, next step is then to conduct a qualitative survey to understand, to contextualize these responses and understand the environment within which these women and men uh, live. Um, and uh, yeah, that's coming up next for Ghana, for sure. It's really about, from UNODC's perspective, moving from theory to practice. This module will hopefully be replicated in the next corruption survey coming up in Nigeria. And I think, you know, again, we heard it before, what we've found in many of these cases is that what happens to women as differentiated impact and experience of corruption it's not exclusive to women. In the survey, we also have people with disabilities covered. But it could also be youth. It could also be minority groups, ethnic groups, and so on. So we need to understand the corruption landscape better in order to address and fight it. Um, I will end uh, with another quote, because I love my quotes. And I will say that tomorrow is International Human Rights Day. And Mary Lawler, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, said this last year. We know that environmental human rights defenders exposing corruption and mega business projects are often at real risk of physical attack. And that women human rights defenders working against corruption are attacked not only for what they do, but for who they are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Great job. And so we come back to you, the listening audience. And does anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any comments? What strategies would you suggest? What do you need clarity about? What strategies would you suggest to unmute the voices of women? OK, so there's a mic there. Please tell us your name. Hi, Annalinda Solano. Um, thank you for a wonderful panel. I have a common question. Jennifer, you mentioned uh, whenever there's no data, it's like the problem doesn't exist. And you said, use the word invisible. I have followed for a very long time this woman, Caroline Criado Perez. She has this uh, wonderful work on, on data bias, and she's she always uh, remarks like how we live in a world that is designed uh, where the neutral gender is, is men. So uh, cancer research, uh, uh, uniforms going to war, um, even the COVID vaccine, for example, wasn't tested in women. So uh, corruption is something that adds to all of this, like you don't have data. And I remember some other friends that work in, in, in this area, and they're like, how we don't enter the data trap, you know? Like, we need that, uh, that's for sure. Uh, because as you said, there's no public policy if there's no data. But at the same time, when we construct a world that gives us more gender-based data, and we don't have those biases, what we can do in order to go through that path in order to take action. Because as, as your work said, 
the problem sometimes is not even that it is invisible, but it's not perceived, it's normalized. So um, what should we do in order to go through that path and, and, and have, you know, not that gender bias? Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, yes, please, Conja, come ask. Um, thank you very much. My name is Dung Pamsha uh, from the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, um, Kuru, Nigeria. Um, let me thank the, um, the panel uh, for giving us your thoughts on the subject matter and the kind of researches that you've been conducting. Um, they're really um, illuminating and um, they've given us um, quite uh, a lot um, to reflect on. Um, when I looked at the, the theme of the discussion, which is on corruption and unmuting um, women voices, um, I thought that um, the direction of, of the discussion should be on how do we unmute um, women's vows, uh, voices you know, to fight corruption. Uh, probably in the, um, during the question, I mean during the answer sessions, you can um, give us more light on that. Uh, but I, I, what I'm taking away from the discussion generally um, is that um, women are impacted differently uh, uh, from corruption. And to some extent, I hear you say women are less corrupt than men in some context. Uh, but I, I was also very happy with, you know, with the uh, comments that both men and women are, are equally corrupted. And I think that is the direction that I, we, we, we should be uh, pursuing. Uh, because in um, action-based research and in public policy-based research, uh, we should be uh, conducting research in such a way as to correct you know, the ills um, which corruption uh, brings to both men and women. Therefore, um, since there are rounds of discussions, I mean, there are rounds of researches to be conducted in Nigeria and Ghana, Probably, you should be um, reflecting on this kind of questions. What kinds of corruption would likely block the participation of women in whatever um, sector of our countries? What kind of corruptions would block women's voices um, to be heard? What kind of corruptions would harm women? So if, 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 if we raise the um, research questions this way, then we would uh, be raising issues around, okay, so what do we do? What can governments do? What can civil societies do um, to address those kinds of corruptions? Rather than saying um, um, you know, women are more corrupt, or I mean men are more corrupt than women. Uh, so let us not stagnate you know, at that level. Let's have discussions around this. This is my suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, so ladies first. <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, I think in the room there's more English speaker. Can I speak in French? Is it possible to speak in French? So anybody? Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je suis Joséphine de la RDC. Et... Uh, J'ai fait un constat depuis les débuts des travaux qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de femmes qui s'intéressent, c'est vrai, dans la lutte contre la corruption. La preuve, dans mon pays à moi, je pense que dans la délégation qui est venue pour participer aux travaux, je suis la seule femme qui est venue pour le camp de la RDC dans cette grande conférence anti-corruption. C'est déjà là encore un problème pour, pour la femme qui a du mal à s'engager de plus en plus dans cette lutte. Parce que même quand il s'agit des violences sexuelles, c'est aussi une autre forme, puisque vous avez évoqué ça ici, une autre forme de, de corruption. Et généralement, les femmes, elles ont peur de s'exprimer, que ce soit même dans, dans, dans ce qui concerne la corruption. Je vais prendre un exemple. Généralement, chez nous... Euh, plus des hommes, ce sont les hommes qui entretenaient ou qui continuent d'entretenir la corruption au point d'écarter les femmes parce qu'ils se disaient 
que la femme en général, de par le principe sociétal, euh, est une bande gérante. Mais le, de plus, les années ont évolué, on a constaté que la femme en elle-même s'est rendue compte que l'aspect financier a fait en sorte que elle ne se retrouve pas toujours au poste des décisions, notamment euh, la présidence de la République. Il y en a de moins en moins. On a des cas de femmes, mais très peu. Chez moi, dans mon pays, par exemple, très peu des femmes accèdent à des postes de décision parce que on se, les hommes ont tendance à les écarter, étant donné que ce sont des bonnes gestionnaires. Mais en même temps, elles se sont rendues compte que plus on est des bonnes gestionnaires, on n'accède pas, on accepte, on accepte pas au poste de décision, et ce qui fait qu'on reste derrière. Et aujourd'hui, on constate que même la femme s'est mise dans la corruption. Elle commence aujourd'hui à tolérer ça parce qu'elle a besoin d'accéder. Ne pensez-vous pas, puisque vous êtes des experts en la matière, que la femme a besoin d'être plus encouragée je pense que euh, demander aux femmes de s'assumer pleinement, de dénoncer à chaque fois, parce qu'une dénonciation, c'est aussi une sorte de lutte contre la corruption. Il faudrait que l'on s'engage, nous, au sortir d'ici, par exemple, que l'on dise à celles qui n'ont pas pu venir que la façon pour nous aussi de s'assumer et d'être au même niveau que les hommes, c'est de s'assumer et d'accepter que l'on peut peut lutter contre la corruption au même titre que les hommes. On est très peu. Je suis la seule, et je ne sais pas on est combien, il y a mon collègue de la RDC qui est là, mais je suis la seule femme. Et même les organisations de la société civile qui travaillent sur la corruption, je ne pense pas qu'il y en ait cinq en RDC. Voilà, j'espère que vous allez nous éclairer pour nous donner des stratégies qui vont faire en sorte que l'on puisse mettre en place et encourager les femmes à s'élancer dans cette lutte-là. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Comment vous appelez-vous Joséphine Bella. Merci. Merci. So, enchanté. Um, yeah, Jennifer will interpret and answer. We'll take the next question, please. Uh, thank you. Please tell us your name. Yes, I will. Uh, my name is Faisal Anwar. I'm from Pakistan. I am a former banker and now I'm an independent consultant. Um, basically, I don't know how to ask this question. I'm very tentative and apprehensive of it. <laughs> um, basically, in some societies, in certain households which have got married couples, a lot of co corruption Uh, on the part of the husband takes place because the wife has a lot of influence on, on, on uh, her partner or her husband uh, because she needs to have luxuries. She wants to see luxuries in her, in her house. And uh, that I've seen in my own society, in my own country, very much so. So I just wanted to know, out of curiosity, if this phenomenon has been studied, has been ever studied by any organization, what have been the findings? And I'm sure that if uh, such is the case, we, we, women can actually play a very important role in stopping uh, a corruption by the males. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yes, please, because time is... So uh, first of all, because yeah, I... I have to leave at one stage. But uh, Madame Josephine, I will translate briefly what she said. Um, she claims that there's not enough women who are engaged in fighting corruption, uh, that she herself is from the DRC. She's the only woman and her female in her delegation. Um, and similar to gender-based violence, and I personally commentary, I would agree, women are afraid to report. Uh, we heard Ivana mention this too. Uh, men keep women out of the network and therefore women have less access to decision-making pos positions, but uh, she claims also that women are now starting to understand that because they are being more integrous, working with greater integrity, they're losing out on opportunities. So now women are actually starting to engage in corruption in view of being able to access these higher positions. And that we are, um, we should call on women to join the fight against corruption, that there are very few organizations in her country, in the DRC, um, such as civil society organizations, others, as in five, uh, working to fight corruption in the DRC. And, and yes, and 
in a nutshell, this was it. Um, going back to the first question, how do we address gender and data bias and so on? I'd like to say including women in discussions surrounding, for instance, um, decisions on how to spend budgets and so on, you will have a very different outcome if you involve women than if you have an all-male all um, group. We saw this, for instance, uh, very recently during the COVID pandemic, uh, countries where there were decisions on um, how to uh, access vaccines, how to uh, have uh, funds for recovery and so on, how it, the distribution was um, decided, differed from country to country if it was all male versus a mixed group uh, of decision makers. So this is important. If we're to unmute vo women's voices, we also need to include them. Um, and then, um, because it is true, they're women or men, I just don't have access. I'm gonna stop here, although I must say that the last question that came up, it's not the first time I hear it yeah. from a different continent. Colleagues. Which one's working? Okay. Uh, I really like the, the question related to what kind of, of uh, um, corruption would uh, um, mute women's voices and basically what forms of corruption are actually influencing the participation of women. Uh, I talked earlier about the percentage and of, of, uh, or access to employment on behalf of women. At the same time, uh, most of the uh, forms uh, the cases of corruption most one of the most prevalent case uh, forms of corruption that women face is corruption uh, during the, the employment procedure it, it's either through bribe it's either through connections or at the end through sextortion which most often actually shows up uh, in the education sector uh, when it comes to relations with uh, with students and and we already heard some some examples of that but also when it comes to uh, when it comes to employment. But there is another uh, uh, form of corruption which is more uh, connected to political corruption, to the way uh, the, the political systems are organized, uh, whether the elections are free, uh, what we have when it comes to regulations on participation of women in the elections, uh, what is the level of internal political party democracy, whether it uh, uh, enables women to participate enough, uh, and also basically these whole political cultures uh, that um, even when there are the best regulations in place, prevent women from actually uh, participate in a really meaningful way. They will put them on the voters' lists as candidates uh, to fulfill the uh, criteria set by the election legislation, but at the end they will not be given uh, true positions of power. And, and th this is all also connected to uh, other forms of corruption uh, and democratic systems that we already heard a lot during the past couple of days uh, uh, of, of, the, of the conference. And I would agree that, uh, I will just finish with that, uh, there's no, and, and I think that the data shows in terms of propensity uh, to bribe and to corruption, there, there is no difference in terms of who is more corrupt, men or women. It's about the access, it's about the opportunity, and I would be happy for women to have more opportunity actually to be corrupt. Okay, um, just, to respond to, <laughs> just to respond to the question about um, unmuting women's voices to fight corruption. I just want to say that the data from the survey in Nigeria gave reasons why women are reluctant to report um, incidences of corruption. And uh, if those reasons are addressed and uh, removed, I'm sure a lot of women who experience corruption will come forward with uh, uh, reporting, which is also a way of um, fighting uh, corruption. And just to say that as we are thinking what is happening in the various countries, we should also think global in terms of using forums like the UNCAC process to also um, get to the roots of the issues um, around gender and uh, corruption. I know that's the discussion for another day, 
but that process should, uh, should also should, uh, should actually uh, be made more uh, gender accessible so that data can be collected at the country level. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's have Laura speak to the question about how the women push their men into conflict. Well, I don't even have the answers, but I've, like, like Jennifer, I've had this question before, and it, it's, it's beyond even women. Society, I know in my country, when you attain a certain position in government, even your own community expects you to be corrupt. Uh, I've been to, or I've heard of burials of important people in government, when, because people are usually buried where they hail from in the village. And then people say, did you see the house that he used to live in? It was tiny, you know, like this. What was this man thinking the entire time he was in government? Uh, but back to this uh, gender dynamic, I think that um, masculinity and femininity, they are all social constructs. And men and women buy into these social constructions. And what you're describing, I, I would call it part of toxic masculinity that both women and men feed into. But in, in highly patriarchal societies, um, like where I come from, I wonder to what extent really women can influence men if they are, if the men are the decision makers. How come in other areas of life, women don't have this profound influence on men, but only in the area of corruption? So there's really need to look at also some of these arguments from a, a gender perspective and interrogate All them right. further. Final thoughts, Laura. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Okay. What so are your final thoughts? My final thought is whole of society approach and again interrogating the gender inequalities that drive some of these influences. Thank you. Jennifer, answers and final thoughts. Final thoughts. Acknowledging our own biases, mm -hmm. I think, is, is such a critical part and starting point for us all. We are all biased, but are we aware of our biases? Thank you. Thank you. Lillian? Final thoughts. Hear all the voices. Give opportunity for all uh, to, to say their say. Yeah, I, I think I ended up the last time with the final thoughts. So, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I think it's been a most interesting session. And I thank you for your participation and for just making it really interesting. My name is Ezinwa Okorafo. I'm an officer of the International Federation of Women Lawyers, FIDA. Thank you, and have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you.